Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. In 1814, Russian writer Ivan Krylov wrote a story called The Inquisitive Man. In the story, a man meets a friend on the street and tells him that he's just been to the Natural History Museum. He goes on about all the astonishing things he saw, nature in all of its variety, butterflies, dragonflies, beetles. He told his friend that he marveled at tiny gnats that were no bigger than the head of a pin. His friend responded, well, that's wonderful. You must, of course, seen the elephant there. What did you think of that? It must have seemed like a mountain. To which the man replied, elephant, are you sure there's one there? And his friend replies, quite sure, yes. And the man says, well, don't tell anyone, but I didn't even notice. You guys, some of you might know that story, the story of the inquisitive man who sees all the little things but misses the one big thing in the room is considered one of the possible origins of our phrase, the elephant in the room. Yeah, there's other, there's other origins maybe, but this is, this is one that you'll find out there. So for us, that phrase has come to mean that there's an obvious problem or a difficult situation that no one wants to specifically talk about. Yeah, there's an, something like if you're at a party, the one that came to mind for me, once I was at a St. Patty's Day party a long time ago, and a big feature of a St. Patty's Day party is the corned beef. And so we were all sitting around and we got our corned beef and then we looked at each other and it was not, it was not edible actually, <laughs> but no one wanted to say anything. The, it was the elephant in the room. We were all sitting there just kind of going like this with the corned beef and no one wanted to say anything. It was the elephant in the room. Well, our gospel finds the disciples gathered on Easter evening, not at a natural history museum, right? Not in a natural history museum, not at a party, not at a St. Patty's Day party, but they are in a room together with a closed door that is locked. And the gospel writer, John, tells us that they're huddled together under lock and key because they're afraid that the same authorities who were against Jesus will find them, gathered there because of the fear for being caught. You can imagine them discussing the details of what might need to happen. How can we keep a low profile? Where is our next meal going to come from? Where should we go? Because we're in Jerusalem. Is this our only safe place? Maybe we should go back to Galilee. So there's fear, a lot of probably detailed talk about what to do. But in all of that fear and detail talk, I have to imagine that something else was on the minds of the disciples. They had to be another thing on their minds and hearts. There had to be an elephant in the room. And it was death. That Easter evening, death was in the elephant in the room. It's the unspoken, you know Jesus is dead, right? You know that, right? We saw it happen. For those who had seen it and witnessed it, they'd also heard Jesus say, it is finished. I heard him say that. It is finished. His life in this world finished, completed. Anyone, everyone who had heard that must have thought, well, this is it. This, this is the end. They had witnessed his death along with all of Jerusalem. And after all, death is certain. Certain 2,000 years ago, and it's certain today. That's the reality. And I was, as I was writing this, it seemed very fitting that on this tax weekend that I quote Benjamin Franklin's famous saying from November of 1789, in this world, nothing is certain except dead, death and taxes, right? Certainties of life. We will die and we will pay money to the government. <laughs> now, some people may find ways to unlawfully skirt <laughs> paying the government paying taxes, but no wonder how creative you are. We will not skirt death. Everyone will die. We know it. The disciples knew it. Sure, Mary Magdalene had seen the risen Jesus and had told them about it. That's what happens in John gospel, John's gospel. Jesus comes first to Mary. And then Peter and the beloved disciples run to the tomb and go inside. And John, the gospel writer, tells us that the beloved disciple believes 
there and then standing in the empty tomb. But we don't know about Peter. We don't know. They just leave the tomb and they go home. And we certainly don't know the disciples' reaction to Mary Magdalene's report of the risen Christ. We only know that they are gathered for their fear of getting caught, not to worship, not to pray, not to discuss Mary's report of the risen Jesus. Still, the elephant in the room was death. You know he's dead, right? It's such a reality, death. John doesn't even get into any discussion of the disciples about it. The elephant of the room, death, is the elephant of our rooms too, I think, at Easter. After the hoopla of wonderful Easter celebrations, the dust of it all settles and it occurs to us, well, wait a minute. You know, death is certain, Jesus died. In the course of our lives where yes, death is certain and where the forces of death take hold in the living of our lives, a loved one dies, a relationship dies, a dream we had held on to for ourself or maybe someone we love doesn't pan out. An organization, an institution we depended on dies. Death and death's forces are such a given, such a given that resurrection, a resurrected Jesus can be really hard to take in. About a year ago, we had our driveway repaved. It was very much overdue for a repaving. It actually, in some parts, looked like a bed of our, a planted bed of our yard with weeds growing up. So it very much needed repaving. The pavers came and they slapped on a good amount of asphalt, inches of it, and voila, no more weeds. About a week ago, um, I saw some bubbles coming up in the asphalt right along the side. And I thought, huh, weird, that is strange. I wonder what that's about. A couple days later, I saw green shoots, literally, coming out of this newly paved asphalt. I saw it with my own eyes. I couldn't believe it. It just didn't make any sense of what I knew. What I knew, a given, was that weeds don't grow under newly asphalted road, right? Inches and inches of asphalt. That was my given, and it was shattered right there. This little, I think it's a dandelion, dandelions coming up. The disciples given, and our given, you know Jesus is dead, right? Death is certain, may be a reality of our world, but Jesus' resurrection is a reality, not of our world, it's reality of the kingdom, of God's kingdom. Jesus' resurrection means that while death may be certain still in our world, and time. Death is not the end. Jesus joins his disciples coming in through a locked door. I just love that part of the story. And though he's the same Jesus, it's him all right. You get that? He has to show, he shows them, it's me. It's me, the Jesus you know, and yet somehow changed, somehow different. If Jesus is in script, Jesus here is bolded and underlined Jesus here in the room. Resurrected, new life that's outside the reality of the world and now bursts into it, shattering our given of death. And Jesus speaks a word of calm, peace, as the kids we were talking with about just a minute ago. He tells the disciples, but in his body, showing them that death wasn't the end, that this out of the world sort of thing breaks into this world in him. To our death, and to the myriad of little deaths we experience in the course of living our lives, Jesus says, peace, my peace be with you. My death and my new life is the beginning. So where there is death, which there will be, and we know all too well in this life, look for resurrection. Now, Thomas missed out on this encounter with Jesus on Easter evening, and when he rejoins the disciples on a different day, death is certainly not the elephant in the room for Thomas, right? He throws down an ultimatum. It might even not even be an ultimatum. It could have been more like a pig's fly comment, right? If pigs fly, if I can put my hands in his wounds, then I'll believe. Nothing unspoken with Thomas. Death as the end was his given too. Now, how do we trust resurrection when death is our given? 
If we look to this encounter with Thomas, I think the one word answer to that question of how to trust resurrection is relationship. It's in relationship with Jesus. And what does that mean? Well, it means in our time of prayer, conversation with him, through worship, what we're doing right now with one another, through our praise of him in music. It's in our study of God's word, reading of God's word with one another. We come to see with eyes of faith and ears of faith that Jesus lives and his resurrected life is God's kingdom breaking in. In that relationship, Jesus comes to us just as he came to Thomas, knowing what Thomas needs. It's a beautiful part of this story that you can so often just miss. Jesus knew what Thomas needed, and Jesus comes to him and offers him his body. Jesus knows what each of us needs, too. Jesus comes to you, sitting in this pew in White Plains, New York, on April 16th, 2023. He knows your particularities and mine. He knows our faith life. He knows our faith ebbs and flows. It's called faith, after all. He knows our doubts and our fears, our sorrows and anxieties. And he says, here, dear child, reach out your hand. Death is not the end. I am resurrection. This is the beginning. May Jesus' peace, the peace that passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds. Amen.